Oh, it's not gonna work. Come on. Let's let the good Lord work. There we go. There we go. There we go. Then I am the one that is on a... What? Burn to the bridges and slam and the bitches and slam in the back of my drag you love. That I am the one stimulating son. I can never die. Dig through the ditches and slam through the ditches and brown on the back of my drag you love. Hi guys, beautiful day, 70 degrees in New York, 75 I think, not good probably for it to be that hot in November, but at the same time, hey, it's a nice day, enjoy it. Oh, buck, going buck wild with a claw this evening. So, I've been talking since the election about where we find ourselves, and specifically how we find ourselves now with a politics that is absolutely sterile and frozen in a signifying war of, of, of a battle of, of symbols, of, a battle of symbolic orders uh, that is totally detached from any greater uh, political project that will, inter that will, that impacts the distribution of resources, uh, the direction of the economy, the direction of the civilization, meaningful the meaningful machinery of life. It is a fully detached puppet show. Uh, and a big reason for that is that the Democratic Party is now becoming and is on an, I think, unstoppable trajectory towards fully embodying the role of a political party for college-educated Americans. In, who will be voting to uphold a certain standard of public morals and uh, etiquette. And that as a result of that, the Republicans, they basically have done what the Republicans have wanted them to do when the Republicans started by building their own party of cultural grievance uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, as when the great crisis began in capitalism and the rate of profit began to fall, and the, the, the labor's back was broken and upper mobility stopped, both parties had to tell a story. And the Democrats, because of their historic association with egalitarianism, got, got off on just being the party of the little guy for a long time because their, their commitment to social progress masked a lack of commitment to economic redistribution. And that got them through the door. The Republicans didn't have that. They were always the party of business. The cultural grievance that was accumulating as a result of the social tra transformation and ferment of the 60s, but was not assuaged by any more upward economic, uh, um, upward economic uh, advancement, which has been what had soothed all previous social upward, uh, uh, you know, uh, social shifts. You, you you essentially buy people off for having their folk ways fucked with, like racism and sexism and all these things. And the thing is, is that they have a price. Everybody has a fucking price. But after the 70s, there was no more laundering it off. And the thing is, that wasn't a bad thing. That's part of creating a liberal subjectivity that can then, you know, create class uh, solidarity that can transcend racial, uh, you know, and gender uh, distinctions. So the Republicans were able to pitch themselves as a party that would address the defense of these cultural institutions, even though their politics, just like the Democrats, necessitated the continuing destruction of those values through the application of market forces and the marketization of all life, which was the bipartisan consensus of both parties and has been since the 70s. And the Democrats, for a long time, they were able to sort of pivot away from a lot of those unpopular things with certain people. You know, they were popular with some audiences. They were less popular with others. And the people who were it wasn't popular with were more located in places that were electorally significant. So they had a disproportionate weight. They were able to say, don't worry. I know that's bad, but look at all of what we can get you. We can put more money in your paycheck, just like FDR and LBJ did. But the thing is, they couldn't. All they could do was NAFTA. All they could do was 
uh, bailing out the banks. All they could do was kicking everybody out of their houses so that Goldman Sachs could buy them back out of pittance and make them renters again. Pauperizing people. And I think in the last, the Obama years is, is, was what fused us into a situation where we have a political party that is now entirely identified in the public mind with social advancement and nothing else. And the Republican Party is fine because they were always just the party of social regression. All the economic stuff was just, was mostly coffee table nonsense for their more pretentious members, their bow tie dipshits. And of course, uh, it was all just a way to give a media gloss on what was going to happen underneath the hood, which was the same machinery of neoliberal exploitation that the Democrats were presiding over without any serious de debate about, about the actual uh, like operating mechanism of the American political economy. And so the Democrats essentially, when fractured against themselves when, when their commitment to economics and their economic uh, egalitarianism and their commitment to social egalitarianism when the piston that drove them seized up because they were no longer able to offer economic egalitarianism all they could offer is more and more social egalitarianism which re creates a greater and greater degree of social reaction and the only thing that could break that tie in the favor of progress is some sort of material politics but as it stands, that's gonna that that engine that that inertia tie goes to capital, and therefore tie goes to Republicans, the number one most enthusiastic party of capital, which means everything will drive toward the Republicans eating all politics, because they will be the most attuned with the mechanisms of uh, of control of the economy. Now the, the liberals though think they have a winner because they've got they think they've got all of the rich people now, which means they could buy all the ads in the world, and they're like. Buying ads is what it's all about. But now we know the ads are reaching people. And I think the ads are reaching people because more people voted this time. More people voted, even though there's less of a ground game in the general election campaign than there's ever been. All air, an entirely a media campaign, basically. Uh, uh, internet and television and shit. Uh, and, and, and it drove, it helped drive this highest turnout in a, a century, 66%, which of course still is abysmal in a democracy. But still very high and prove that people are paying attention to this but they are not seeing what the people making these ads are seeing because they do not have the screen of ideology that they obtained when they went through the ideological car wash of going to college and so they're going to head towards the more visceral politics of the republican party because the virtues that are supposed to be wrapped around the democratic party it must be stressed they are entirely ornamental they demand of people to that they be behave a code of etiquette because you say it's racism, you say it's all lives matter, but it's, it's about you know Black Lives Matter and it's about abortion and stuff. If you look at the trajectory of America, if you look at our trajectory, can you really tell me that the Democrats are intervening in any way against any of those things or do they just want to promote a culture where you pretend to care about them? And if you're not invested in the college thing, the idea that if you get smart, you will deserve to live, basically. You will have an interior life. That that means you're a full person and you don't have to work a shitty job. You get to work, a, you get to live in the life of the mind. And if you don't get to live in the life of the mind, if life, if life fails you somehow, if you end up having to work in the gig economy, if you end up falling into the working class and away from intelligentsia, uh, well, that's because of capitalism and now you can fight it. But what tools do you have to battle it? You only have the battle with the tools you learned in college, and those tools are uh, intersectional oppressions uh, and nothing having to do with capitalism, or capitalism as like a, a smokescreen for deeper ills. Because remember, going to college is where a lot of people, this is where people get their idea of what it is to be a political subject. Even people who don't go to college get it from college because they get it from the media and, and, and educational industry, you know, like K through 12 and then the media. And those things are all stocked by people who go to college. So one way or another, college is, is screening how, is, is, is making you understand what these terms mean. And you go to school and you learn to do these things and believe these things. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was talking about um, how... All right, so because that's the screen, right? That You either go through it personally if you're a member of the middle class who sends their kid to college, 
or a member of the working class who gets yourself to work your way up to college uh, or pay for it by just taking out a bunch of loans. Either way, or if you don't go to college but you watch TV and you look on the internet, if any of that happens and you decide to vote, if you decide voting matters in some way as opposed to just uh, checking out entirely, then college is shaping your understanding of how this stuff works. And if you go to college, what happens? That is where, as an American, you discover what it is to have a class. Because while we all live class every day, class is not lived consciously in this country. I have talked a lot about why it isn't. Pringles in a tube is the, the quick uh, uh, slang for it. The process by which people who were turning into a coherent working class during the early 19th, 20th century were distributed across the hinterlands in a process of suburbanization uh, and, and ghettoization meant to reinforce distinctions, geographical, social, and racial uh, between uh, working people. And, and the media then filling that role of just denaturing social life away from the surroundings and towards a monoculture that is totally controlled by capitalism. That process creates these depoliticized beings, which is what we are. So college is the, only, is the lighthouse that is searing it into our lives because we do not have the experience of a 19th century worker of living a life of common exploitation in common quarters and exchanging because we don't have anywhere else to put our energies. We will be, if we're social animals, we're not going to be having a pseudo-social life of interaction with people who aren't actually around us by watching things, by interacting with people in a way that doesn't build the way social bonds build. You, you have those bonds, you have those experiences, and it creates an understanding of a common exploitation, a common misery, and a common target for your anger. And that is where politics comes from. We do not live those lives. We live mediated existences where our social lives are totally uh, ateliated. So we do not live through class, even though we are totally determined by class. But class is real. We have a record of it. We have a record of class struggle in this country. If you're a smart person, you recognize it. So when you go to college, you learn, yes, class is real. Yes, here's Marx, here's Engels, here's the history of class struggle. But also look at this. Here's the fall of the Berlin Wall. Here's Tiananmen Square. Here's the Gulag. Uh, here are, uh, are the philosophical uh, uh, shortcomings of Marx. Uh, uh, oh, you like Hegel, huh? Well, here's a little Karl Popper to tell you about how dialectical materialism cannot be scientific because it's not so falsifiable. Zwoosh! And then, of course, there's an entire economics department to tell you that the undergirding idea of class exploitation is, in fact, gibberish, is, is snake oil and pseudoscience. The real thing is, the, is that we are not social beings who generate social life through interactions with one another. No, we are all individual beings of pure, monadic, random uh, personal drive banging off of one another and creating some sort of harmony out of the cacophony of wasteful uh, total social competition. That's the reality we are in. We are, Hobbes is right. But if you're a smart person, a sensitive person, and you're learning to be sensitive because that's one of those values that you learn in college. You learn how to keep your voice down. You learn how to consider up other people's feelings. Things are bad. Why are they bad though? Why are they bad? If we can't stop them that way, how can we stop them? Why are they bad? And the answer that comes back is, well, there's this other stuff. There's racism. There's patriarchy. These structures are real because people feel those in their lives. You live life through the lens of gender. You live life through the lens of race because it actually does structure people's responses to you in a way that life in a capitalist system where all labor is, is diffused and the experience of laboring is diffused. Uh, and the experience of processing your life is diffused by media away from interactions with other people at all. Uh, you're you're going to go, yeah, that makes sense. Because I see racism in my life. I see it in my media. I see it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've seen gender oppression. These things are real. And so you get out of that factory now, knowing you want to get things better. Maybe even understanding that capitalism is in some way the thing responsible. But essentially, though, because of your emotional connection to these other categories and these other wrongs, you will always end up, when it comes to the question of how do we move forward, because remember, we're not moving from a common experience of exploitation. We're moving from these, this system of, of monads. We've turned into those creatures that they turned us into. And so we bounce off one another 
And so all we have is what is within us. We don't have per shared experience. So we say, hey, what about this stuff? What about gender? Uh, what about racism? And the thing is, those things are real and people experience them. And the, some people actually experience them and they are even more invested. And how do you tell them they're wrong? It's impossible because those things are felt in a way that class isn't. Class is an idea. These things are real in that they are really felt. And of course, the irony is, is that the class is the real thing and race and gender are the fake things, but that's because they're superstructural. That's the definition of a superstructural element. The way you know how the thing, the fucking tube goes into the, into the vent. And that is why there can be no forward progress within this system. And anybody who's telling you that the Republicans are the real party who are really going to do it, oh boy, they're really going to do it. The Republicans are going to be the party of uh, class. Has, has had their brain melted by being on here too fucking long. Because they have looked into the mirror and, and seen like the grass on the other side, but they because they haven't lived there in the psychic space of being on the right, they have no idea that it's a mirror fucking image. What is the difference between thinking, you know, AOC is really going to push the uh, push Biden's agenda to the right, to thinking, you know, uh, 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 Josh Hawley, he might be uh, anti right to work uh, and anti raising the minimum wage, and mostly just to talk about uh, like. Uh, uh, he only talks about class issues in terms of pure cultural grievance and then maybe uh, shaking a fist at China which is not something the Democrats are hate, or, or the uh, military machinery is bad about fucking Cold War with China is the next engine of the fucking economy if we're going to have anything it's going to be military build up to fucking uh, uh, some sort of brinksmanship with China but he's really actually he, he comes, it comes from the heart for him you're a sucker you're looking for an answer here because you don't realize there cannot be an answer found there because you're entranced by it. Some, for some reason or another, this gets you off. And why does it get you off? At the end of the day, because you are in the college sphere. You were a Democrat even if you don't want to be. All these people who hate liberals and hate Democrats are the most democratic and liberal people, ironically enough, because they are committed to the framework of working within this structure and this media paradigm and this pathetic roundelay within this party that cannot be reformed. Both parties that cannot be reformed. A party system that is detached from uh, material politics. Thanks to the de-politicization uh, of the American political subject. We are Pringles in the tube. Ba Obama and uh, Trump back to back represented the creation of a thesis and an antithesis of cultural conflict that are now be wrapping people around them as we drift towards calamity. In, with a with a uh, economic system that, due to a declining rate of profit, is being driven towards maximum profit extraction, which means it can no longer be with re restrained by the political superstructure that is put around itself, that's supposed to regulate it and keep it from self destruction. There is no more money left for that. The profit motive overrides everything, which is of course the 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 the. the the death thing within capitalism. That is why Marx is correct. That like Marxism is teleological and people say that's bad, but I think that his argument that capitalism is doomed is 100% correct because that drive whereby once the system hits a critical, uh, a critical downward slope in profit and it needs to marketize more and more of, of the social structure in order to find it and replace the lost stuff, uh, the political structure that like distributes away from uh, crisis, it distributes it with surplus. The surplus is what allowed the New Deal consensus to f form and the Fordist is compromised to be made. The middle class, the working class, to be bought off, and that's gone. So that means the superstructure is now empty and cracking and collapsing away from just the beating heart of capitalism that will eventually uh, just consume itself. The question is, what intervenes with that? And the thing about Marx is you can never say that he was too optimistic because it says right in the fucking beginning of the manifesto that class conflict resolves either in the victory of one class or the other or the common ruin of the contending classes. 
People forget that because he's talking about ancient societies that all rose and fell, but they all rose and fell within, uh, heter like within closed systems, within a greater ecology of, of, of a greater biological and ecological biome that didn't contain all of that. This system is now totalized. So when it collapses, there will be nothing to come after. So this is the final, that's the ending of the cycle. Like that's supposed to be, that is, that is said to be like a contradiction within Marxism that, you know, he, 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 he mis, misapplies Hegel by um, saying that there can never be an end to the, the, uh, the dialectical turning. And of course, in a greater sense, there cannot be, but in just the narrow sense of a civilization of an actual like biological species consuming and destroying itself by, by not being able to regulate its consumption of its surroundings is totally, uh, totally realistic in my opinion it's not it's not uh it's not even eschatological really other it's just observational it's observation it's, it's observation of of the second law of thermodynamics operating within a closed system which is what we're dealing with so if something's going to intervene it's going to be the working class finding again themselves as a class I don't think it's going to be through, uh, it might start in America. I don't think it necessarily will. I think that there will be little fires everywhere. And I think that the, the ability of any kind of coordination and cooperation between the working classes of China and the United States, I think are incredibly important. Because while there's this like move towards conflict and then eventual merger on one condition or another, at the top of Chinese and American society, there needs to be a corresponding push from both bases towards one another. And this, I think, puts paid to the, in, in my mind, for all of time, the question of uh, the whole, is the PMC a class contest? Which is now, I think, finally, like, after all the bullshit stripped of it, the real nut of all of these meta arguments that are consuming people on the online left. And in my opinion, this is a perfect example of an argument that has that exists to be had and can only be had and can never be resolved, because it is a classic case where both pe both sides are correct. Both sides are arguing their proposition to a correct end. In my opinion, the difference is is that they are not in response to one another. On the narrow question of is the preMC -pre a class, at, or is like the cultural is cultural capital real capital? Is there such a thing now? Has, has, like, has cultural capital transformed the relationship between people uh, and uh, between people that we call class away from means of production and towards a social relationship? And I would say that that question has been resolved, in my opinion, especially by this election. And the answer is yes. PMC, whatever you want to call it, this lumpen bourgeois, petty bourgeois, as I've called it, it's a class. It's a class. It's a class. It's a class. But on a larger, in a larger way, not within that argument, but within the context that the people are making the argument, the people who uh, disagree with that are correct because it doesn't matter. Because they're a class in a new class structure that is entirely superstructural and only exists for the purpose of wielding political power in the, in the spectacle. And it has no connection to the gears of, of, of power, to the means of production, which are driving themselves towards total, uh, total marketization and asset stripping of the social realm. And the reason, and you think like, well, that's pretty patent easy. Why can't they stop fighting? And the reason is very simple. Because in order to argue that what I just argued and win the larger argument, you have to concede then that none of this fucking matters. That none of your conversations are meaningful in that you are, they are occurring within a sterile political uh, environment where people who are within a Katelfkin closed bubble, an Eloy-like bubble within the American hellscape, the people inside the little double and Zardoz who dance around and just spend their time, they're the eternal beings bored out of their minds, just making up little intrigues to fill their time, like at the court of Versailles. 
And that means everybody. That means everybody on every point. That means everybody, every fucking stupid ball person owning people with uh, epic class reductionism, as well as every weepy ID pole dipshit who thinks the fucking crystal max are on the corner. It's all entirely contained within that bubble. And you can't admit that because then you've lost, you've both lost. You're both losers then. There's no way to win. All right. Damn, I've only gone 20 minutes. It feels like longer. All right, I had a whole thing I was going to say, but I feel like I covered a lot of it. Damn. Yeah, maybe not. It might be good. Uh, and of course, but you say, well, all right, that doesn't answer anything. That doesn't help us. How do we, how do we organize? And, I, and the answer is, I'm sorry, you don't. You don't organize. You're tainted. You're tainted. You can participate... You can participate. Keep your head on a swivel and for the love of God, participate. But you cannot organize. And I know that that's another horrifying, uh, you know, act to ask somebody to let go of that degree of, like, feel, sense of autonomy over themselves and their political destiny and their family's destiny. And like, you're telling me that, like, we're on this, that we're on this, like, uh, uh, we're on this collision course? We're like strapped to this rampaging horse going towards the fucking cliff and I can't do anything? No, you can do something, but I feel like if you're trapped in this, this, this epistemic realm, I don't think that you can communicate to normal people. I don't think you know what normal people want. I don't think I do. Because I, we are so fully screened at such a deep level by, this, by the reward matrix you receive in college, man. It's, it's, it's Dunning-Kruger stuff. You won't even know what you're doing that's going to like make it hard for you to communicate and, and to get across ideas. You won't even know what you're doing because it's all stuff that's deeper than thought and it's deeper than strategy. I'm saying that if there's going to be organizing of meaning that's going to come up, it's going to be people on the workplace dropping their fucking stuff. And they're not going to be communicating in memes. They're not going to be communicating across like a distances of irony. They're not going to be communicating across like wondering about where each other falls on like the Danny Fatante question or whatever the fuck we're using to like separate the, 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 the sheep from the goats. And then people who have had that taint can participate. But holy shit, I hope they can keep their fucking mouth shut. I swear to God, I hope they do. Because if they don't, we're fucked. Because what happens when you go to college, especially if you come from a family of college, where, you're in where you get this stuff before you even get it, is that this is all for something. So you're not just learning these lessons. Like, you're, college do, is, is, it does turn you liberal in the sense that it makes it harder for you to believe superstitious bullshit. It makes you harder to believe provincial truths that only, that have a social value that is like denatured away in a more, uh, in like a more secular uh, 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 environment, like a, 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 a more uh, liberalized space. I mean, we are liberal subjects. The entirety of our uh, political project is liberal at like its deepest senses. And both sides, there's no escape from that within our institution. So it's going to build liberality. It's going to make liberal subjects. And I would say that all those Republicans are liberal subjects just as much. They believe all this shit to an extent. It's just they stop believing at another extent. Like they, like they stop believing the stuff about why things are bad after, oh, okay, uh, this is just the way it is. People are bad. And then they go, okay, fine then. I'll be bad. I have proved myself a villain. And they're resp and why be bad? Either because they have an, a, a religious ideology that allows them to think that. Either they have a scientific ideology that allows them to believe that. Like they, under they think that uh, the bell curve is real. And that therefore human worth is determined by one's like genetic propensity for doing well on a fucking test. Which obviously is psychotic. But hey, it's an ethos. And the liberal goes, he believes more. He believes too. No, there's racism. There's sexism. These things are bad. But it's all just a big, it's a, it's a totalized experience that people only, they, they, they're exposed to all of it subconsciously or consciously, but they adhere to it uh, depending on their experiences in life, their demographic layout, and then their personal experiences in life determine how they respond to this, 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 this car wash of ideology that they go through. 
And they're going through it to have a nice life. Because you learn that God isn't real, that there's no real transcendence. This is the only life we have. Therefore, we better get the most out of it. What do we want out of it? What do we want out of it? Pleasures. How do we get pleasures? Money. How do you get money? Good job. Because remember, you're not overthrowing the, anything. You're not redistributing anything. You're going to be exploited for life. How will you be exploited? I would like to be exploited for my mind. I would like to be taken seriously as a smart person. And that way, that I, and I get to sit around. How about that? And then you pursue it. And they say, okay, good. You want that? Well, here's some more stuff you got to know. Everybody's equal. Everybody's the same. Uh, they're this, this, uh, cultures are different because of things like geography, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, capitalism is how we negotiate the differences between people. Uh, bad things were done in the past that, that are still around now, and that's why some people do worse than other people. And it's good for everybody if we all do well. So, hey, let's all of us help each other. Now, that's using like the real truth, the deep universal liberalized truth that we are all connected to one another, which is not even liberal. It's deeper than liberal. It's liberal is just the way to express it in like the language of political uh, philosophy, the language of like lived, uh, you know, uh, lived social experience. Without like without the the close kin networks of that that came before, or like the the religious uh, societies of orders that are all gone now. And so I go into the world and I want to, what do I? And I'm aware that I am better off than other people. Why am I better off? Why do I deserve to be better off? I'm smarter than them. I worked harder than them. They're not bad people necessarily, although some of them are, but that's just the way it is. And honestly, at a certain level, I deserve it more because I am more adhering to these values of being polite, of being racially aware, of being aware of uh, gender oppressions. These things make me more worthy. They make me worthy of a middle class existence and to be able to work with my mind and not my hands, even though I know that my life is allowed to exist because of the exploitation of others. It's unfortunate, but unavoidable. And this flows into the who deserves it more thing. We're going to get neoliberal misery on everyone. The question is, the question will be, will our policies be designed to highlight the misery of others versus one group versus others? And the liberals are going to turn the hammer of the state against the, the disgust, the racists. They will do that. Like it's, you're going to see FBI style entrapments uh, on QAnon people and, uh, and right wingers all over the place to justify this new uh, security status that's being necessitated by the fact that, oh shit, we're not doing anything about the COVID catastrophe and life is falling apart at the seams and people are being evicted and they can't afford medicine and, and anime and fucking uh, social alienation have overtaken every element of life and our fucking physical infrastructure is falling apart. And we're going to cheer on opium deaths. I'm going to get dab on deindustrialization. Of course, when the conservatives get back in, oh boy, it's going to be, they're going to make the fucking kids in the cages a fucking reality show. They're going to like sh show it with a laugh track at nine o'clock on Fox. Cop killings, they're going to love them. But the things are going to happen either way. Those kids are going to be in those cages. Those guys are going to get shot in the streets. It's just going to be a sense of power is going to be on who you're feeling like you're blaming. That's what voting is going to be. And so you come out of college thinking that you deserve a way of life in, in exchange for holding certain values. Being smart and being talented, but also holding certain values. But then, I mean, and if you succeed, well then... Then you're, it's like you're a liberal for a very easy reason because it's to your economic interests. Why would you want to change things? You're doing good. Like all those people with six figures, even me, I'm sorry, cannot be trusted. By definition, cannot be trusted. Should be taken with not a grain of salt, but a zillion piles of salt. Now, of course, this is when I say, for entertainment purposes only, I'm not doing politics. I swear to God, this is entertainment. Please, I'm telling it to you, caveat emptor, this is entertainment. Besides, this is a fucking vlog. It's free anyway. Fuck off.
But if you fall out, if you don't get that gig, if you end up having to scrounge and you're fucking crippled by student loans, and all you have is your good opinions to fucking pin your worth on because you didn't get the commensurate life experience that you thought you were going to get, then you have to hold to those beliefs even tighter. And they become more inflexible and they become the only thing that you can think about. And how do you deal with people who don't have that set of Pavlovian responses built into their brain, who haven't gone through the Skinner box of college to come up with that like basal instinctual stuff? What if they're more equipped to like give a shit about stuff that's actually involved in their life because they don't experience exploitation as as uh, anxiety and guilt the way that college educated people do. Even the poor ones, because remember, they're aware of their privilege. Or their class rage, if class conscious rage, if they are a member of a minority. Either way, they're aware of it and it anguishes them. They don't think of it that way. And so they might have different opinions than them on things that they think are red, red, like, this is a red line. This person is racist. This person is sexist. This person is homophobic. And it's like, yes, correct. But if they were building a political project, they care so little about that because they're trying to actually, these people would be trying to build through them workplaces, remember. This isn't through the political structure. This is workplaces. They're work trying to make it so that their fucking lives don't suck. Those things won't come up. And if you do, guess what? There will be enough people of the other races and who went to college to say, hey, you know what, maybe not. And they'll be like, yeah, you're right. Because we know that's what happened. Union households are, were, at least until recently, up to like 10 to 15% less racist in their public pronouncements, according to Pauli, for, gen for like decades. Like it had a f fundamental impact on the way people viewed things like that. And it came from the ground up. Now that's coming from the top down, it is merely a disciplinary machine. You're supposed to feel bad. Why? Not to be a better person because you have not gotten that built into your head that you're going to be a better person. You're going to deserve this because you're a better person and you don't have any, any of the actual economic benefits to show for it. So why should you care? And that was the big question of 2020 and why so many working class people voted for Trump. Every, to an, the answer to everything that you said about Trump could have been said to by, could have been responded to by a working class person who is vaguely interested in politics and coming in to vote with this question. Why should I care? And the, where you would have to get to to get to them isn't worth the journey because you've already fucking lost them. A perfect example of this I remember is from the campaign. Kristen Gillibrand obviously hilariously ate shit uh, during the campaign because she fucking better trousers on, uh, on being the Me Too candidate but it turns out, oh no, you're talking about Democratic primary voters. These are a bunch of old white people who love the Clintons. They don't want you rock, rocking the bolt. You know, this, this identity stuff, remember, is for the younger people. This is how things are shaping up. Older Democrats, older Republicans are still, you know, this, uh, political change, like scientific change, is one funeral at a time, to paraphrase Thomas Kuhn. Uh, what was I talking about? All right, Gillibrand. So she was, and it's like, oh, they don't actually care about this stuff. Oh, shit. But her one viral moment on the campaign trail was when she was in Youngstown, Ohio, which used to be a Democratic stronghold. Uh, it was the district where James Trafficant, uh, the extravagantly corrupt former sheriff of Youngstown, who was uh, kicked out of the, uh, Congress for being a crook, who... Uh, was just wildly on the take from the fucking mafia. Had an amazing wig, was known for his uh, wild theatrics on the house floor one time yelling, beam me up! Great American. Um, and the guy who switched Republican at the end of his life, like everyone in Youngstown has. It's, it went to Trump. Uh, I think for the first time. Uh, and there was a young white woman with a kid and she was explaining how you know her tougher life was and she asked why should i care about black lives matter what 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 does that mean why should i care what what why should i care what's no what was i remember now she said why do i what what is white privilege i don't feel like i have white privilege and her response was something about how look things might be tough but hey your family has these possibilities and your son he won't have to worry about getting killed and and then so these are these different things 
and she got a little boost out of it. It gave her a little juice. And I saw her at uh, Netroots Nation. She was one of the losers who showed up. Biden didn't show up because they're a bunch of fucking Ill Ill irrelevant dorks. And she um, repeated it word for word and even added like the voice crackle she used on the first time. One of the most phony things I've ever seen. And everyone thought that was great. And just think if you're that woman. You didn't go to fucking college. And this woman tells you, no, no, no. You sh you, even though life is incredibly hard for you and, and I'm a politician and you're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be voting for my life getting better. Like you're supposed to have a pitch to me that my life's better than it is now. And you're saying, no, you should feel bad for somebody else or you're a bad person. Nothing about what you get. Nothing about how this helps you in any way. Now, if you've gone to college, you can connect it. It's like, well, of course, you know, racism is, is intersectional with other oppressions. And to alleviate one is to, you know, increase our political ability to fight a wide array of uh, exploitations that will help your life in many ways. And, and they, they have not gotten there. They never got that built up in the first place. So it's just binging off the fucking high. And then the answer... If, if it's and, and it's eventually boils down to she asked Gillibrand about fucking white privilege why should I care and Gillibrand just said because I tell you so that was it because I tell you so because if you don't you're a bad person and people will judge you for it if they find out about it in public you're gonna get dragged honey and you know what you should walk around feeling bad And I know that this is horrifying because it's like, no, 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 oh my God, you're saying we got to go to the Republicans or something? No, they're completely captured by the, they were captured first. They set the terms for this. Obama just arrived first as like the final embodiment of the, of the trajectory because he emerged in the fucking furnace of the fucking uh, 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 2008 collapse. Like the atom got split in 2008. Political reality completely evaporated. And we had two parties to fight, just like we did in 1932, a Democratic and a Republican Party. Republican Party in power, presiding over a collapsed fucking economy, a Democratic Party in opposition. What did the Democratic Party represent in 1932? It represented this old skein of, uh, it's a, a collection of uh, middle class reformers and big city uh, ethnic Catholic um, political patronage networks. And then working class people who were fucking pissed and were fucking uh, organizing in a way that had never been seen, who were, were striking uh, both within unions and, 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 and opposition to union uh, authorization, S sit down strikes where you de they deny the, the access to capital that the, the capital demanded uh, or the capitalists demanded. Uh, and that pressure from below exploded the economic, uh, the political consensus and restructured it and essentially brought labor to the table in the distributive question of what to make out of the American political economy. That moment ended in the 1970s, the Carter administration. That was the death of labor involvement in government. What we've had since then is a zombie Democratic Party whose egalitarian heart is no longer beating. It carries with it the uh, the symbolic associations of, to a small degree, the New Deal and, and the Great Society, but to a large degree, social progress over the last 40, 50 years. That's all it is. It's just this ghost. It's a, it's a, it's a purely uh, culturally reflective ghost because the material body is dead. And the Republican Party is not dead. The Republican Party... It's it's uh, it's a it's it's turning towards this uh de de this device it's this device of pure extractive destruction, and like this process of you know fascization of, of of like ethnic nationalism it's real and it is impacting politics and it is going to continue to impact politics because that is the the Republican side of the cultural uh the culture war arms race is towards more and more an extreme racial uh, hostility and racial punishment. And that is terrifying, and it's awful, but it will not be interdicted from either end of this. It's not going to be fucking college boy, uh, dork, 
dark enlightenment edgelords and podcast hosts migrating into the Republican Party and making Tucker Carlson their Elizabeth Warren. They will be sheep, they will be sheep dipping themselves into oblivion just like people did for Biden. And just like they'll do for Kamala, even though they would swear they wouldn't today. And so it's going to have to, uh, it's a sucker's bet either way. Third party is the only thing. Now, I'm not saying it's going to start as a party. I'm just going to say that you should just ignore electoral politics until the moment something emerges. Because this thing cannot be intervened with at this point. Bernie had a chance. I realize now that I think if Bernie had spent all of the money he got, he raised on paying field organizers instead of advertisements, he might have had a chance. But the thing is, is it's, that's one of those Dunning-Kruger things. It wouldn't occur to people at that point of politics who spent their lives accruing that many etiquette points by being that successful in their lives to even consider that. And that's the other part of it, is that now if you're, uh, if you're, if you've succeeded in this matrix, if you've gotten that media job, if you've gotten that uh, mind working job with your education and you're not delivering food and you're able to make ends meet and maybe you have a Patreon to leverage your online brand, you are by any measure succeeding, but because this is a precarious time, you are precarious. And because you are aware that one segment of the thing that keeps you suspended in God's grace is your good opinions about things like race and gender, you're going to have to keep reinforcing them, and you're going to have to keep betting, bidding up, just as the psychos on the right are bidding up, away from material politics and towards symbolic representational bullshit. And that's why I don't think it can come from within. Maybe some, maybe some shit in the firmament will be like seen by people outside of this fucking bubble, and they'll, they'll like take it from there maybe, and then maybe other people will join and contribute knowledge, but it cannot come from within this cycle. Don't be afraid to let your body politic die. All right, there's some other stuff I was going to talk about, but I honestly think I got most of it. Yeah. Maybe some, let me see here. Okay, uh, one more thing I was going to say. So, one thing that a lot of people like to talk about is what comes after Trump? The competent fascist, as people say. Because now, I don't think anybody but the most die-hard anarchist dipshits can tell you that Trump is a fascist in any meaningful sense. Uh, so now the game comes down to, all right, well, what's the next thing to get terrified of to drive us towards the two-party system? What's the next thing to make us engage at this symbolic realm of this stupid joust? Uh, what's, the next, what's the next boss in this video game? And I would say that that's not a thing to worry about. That competence doesn't enter into this. In fact, if, if Trump is totally, like, reborn, if we get Trump again, like another Trump-type character, not Trump specifically, but a guy who hits the same vein that Trump does, he's going to be incompetent by definition because he won't have been a politician. He will just be another lumpen dipshit like the rest of us. He wouldn't have gone through the, the disciplinary process of moving through the political realm. Uh, if he is a politician, he will not be able to do any of the good fascist stuff people are terrified of. All the all the rally rousing and all like the, the keeping the grassroots organized because there can be no redistribution, even racially coded. Like the idea is, oh, they're going to give us white Medicare for all. No. White UBI. No. No. No, no, no. The, the, the populist uh, element of this will be wildly violent uh, uh, immigration enforcement uh, and... Oh, and maybe breaking up big tech along certain lines. And, of course, distributing it, you know, among favored groupings. Uh, because, of course, posts are the only thing that a lot of these people really fucking care about. And you might say, oh, great, that's huge. We're going to liberate ourselves from big tech. 
Yes, because antitrust has, has such a great record in slowing uh, the train, the the speed of uh, capitalism. It's been, it's been. I mean, my God, like it wasn't even able to. The the New Deal at its height wasn't able to 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 properly uh, prevent uh, uh, monopolization. What the fuck is this government gonna do? It would just be it would be a cosmetic thing by definition because anything that's too structurally component, anything that like uh, anything that like uh, uh, um, post leftists like to talk about that is good about breaking up media monopolies would or or like the tech industry would not be obtained because if it's good, it's structural and if it's structural, it's not up for discussion. Everything else is ornamental. Somebody keeps asking for an SDS uh, split and integrated pass. I did a Weatherman episode. I didn't talk about it too much in depth, but I did talk about the weather, the SDS split in the Weather Underground inebriated past episode. So check that out. That is, I believe, where I debuted my concept of uh, of the post-political American subject being, instead of Marx's French peasantry being the potato sack, in fact, the Pringle tube. I'm still very proud of that. Now, anybody who chooses the right in this coming battle is doing so not because they've been forced to by the left. It's then because the things they value in political argumentation, the things that they get out of doing this argumentation online, are uh, a line that they want to own. They want ownage. They want ju they want uh, resentment and jouissance. They don't want to. They don't want the super ego pushing down on them. They don't want the feminism. They don't want the feminine female collaborative womb energy of college Democrat bullshit to intrude upon their desire to fucking do some awesome riffs and fucking troll people. Because at the end of the day, there are limits to how far you can troll on the left. Because there should be, because you're trying to establish an egalitarian conception of human worth. But those are only good if they're part of a project, if they're just used as a club, which is the thing. This is the real essence of it, I think. Is that the think that you can the thought that you can ever defeat these people in the the in, within the confines of the argument is futile, because they know you're lying. As Trump said to Biden about the kids in the cages, you built the cages. They know that the liberals are lying, that they are racist, that they are scared about black people, that they are like white people are are white liberals. White liberals are scared of black people. They're not like being around them sometimes. And it's not because they hate them. It's because they feel guilty. Robin DiAngelo said or wrote a whole book saying the only way that white people should behave around black people is in a state of constant tension and misery. In order to get a paycheck, remember, that's why. If your paycheck didn't depend on it, why would you want to do that? And being asked to do that, it's going to create resentment. And you can say no, like the under all, underlying values of egalitarianism and anti-racism are all real, and so privilege is real. You can prove to me these are all true in a fucking, on a map. You can get me there because I went through the fucking fire, but these people have not. And you don't have time or inclination or incentive structure to do it. You cannot do it. No, but I'm going to, because they see through it, because what is the liberal order that is being defended here. Who are the politicians we're being asked to vote for? Hypocritical frauds who allow misery to go unchecked, who commit the extreme social sadism of building a situation where we have to warehouse children trying to come into this country because we decided to throw a border up because we fucking need to arbitrage uh, labor costs across international boundaries, and no one's saying anything about getting rid of that. So those f kids will be in those fucking cages. And then we dis demand that you feel bad about it. For nothing. It's like King Louis the Fourteenth making his fucking courtiers spend the night spinning around to his amusement, afraid to stop dancing.
They know it's bullshit. And you know it's bullshit too, which is why you've got to fucking flog it even harder. So that's why I'm saying these arguments cannot be engaged with. It is all wasted air. You can watch maybe. You can listen to some people who talk about politics, I hope. But my God, you're not building real fucking practice out of this. You're grabbing handfuls of sand trying to build something. And it's not wet. Thank you. You can see my cheekbones again. I think that's why people are saying that I'm looking good lately. The cheekbones are back, baby. Okay, I think I pretty much... Oh, right. Uh, yeah, no, no competent fascism. If, 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 if our democratic system of governments, if, if these structures break up and fall apart, which they very well might do, and in fact are probably going to do in the next 50 years. It will happen no matter who's in charge. It'll probably be Republicans because of the way the Democrats are built structurally to be destroyed because of their vestigial relationship to the means of production relative to the Republicans. But you have the fact that, like, you know, there is a global market and there is China con to contend with. The, the, the Democrats could get in there, you know. They could globalize it. They could do enough globalism to make it happen. They could propagandize hard enough, I guess, although they're, I think they got their work cut out in front of them if you look at these polls and you look at the way that the Republicans lock in partisan control in a minoritarian way every time they get close to power. Um, but it'll be, even if it's racially coded, it will not be racially motivated. It will be the final, the final revealing of the techno-feudal skeleton. And I gotta say, the most important thing is, is that if you if this third thing emerges, if this third fucking force emerges, it will by definition and without any worrying about it or any fucking DSA conference arguments about points of procedure and which fucking things to pass and which or and how much BDS to do, without any of this this liberal class uh, anxiety uh, uh, theater, these things will happen. These things will be swept aside because the because. People are right when they say that the working class is not white. Of course it isn't. It's 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 filled with fucking minorities. My God, like, and, and there's no nationalism that can be used to bring them together in some bullshit uh, harmony with with like the state the way that they can on on the on white side. And that leavens against it. That means that the white people who you can reach who aren't politicized to like care about this stuff in structured gendered terms the way that the asshole and the pussy parties want it to be, can be reached on a fucking material ground and then everything else will melt away. They might still be racist. They will still be sexist, but they will not be on the agenda because they won't care enough. And that is how you synthesize away from those problems. You do not decide them through figuring out a fucking line online with everybody pointing guns at each other like it's the end of Reservoir Dogs trying to come to some perfect threading of the needle between all of these oppressions. That's not going to happen. Those arguments exist to be had. It is a bunch of fucking... Uh, uh, the the plastic popcorn on the ground everyone's stepping on it the packaging shit and you don't have to con not st not talk about this stuff but my god you have to do something else you have to put this stuff in this fucking perspective it deserves to be which is for entertainment purposes only if you're trying to feed any human monkey you have any like desire for human des human destiny fulfillment, any sense of species being that hasn't been stripped away by the market. If you have a feeling that you want to move towards towards the human destiny of, you know, collective self-actualization, then you're going to have to do that. You can do that too, but in addition, not entirely. I hope that made sense. That felt pretty good. But those competent fascists, it's not going to be the, it's not going to be uh, the fascism. It's going to be the competence. It's going to be turning the key on a machinery of technological surveillance, uh, 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 compulsion, and and uh, and uh, basically human habit trails that won't need ideological justification. It will just be the skeleton of authority itself. Because author because like authoritarianism and fascism are the social architecture of authority. 
it's necessary when you have like a, a, an actual social existence. If there's no social being, if we are totally atomized, then power can be mere authority because our ability to resist it is non-existent. Jennifer Government, I read that book. It's a little heavy-handed, obviously, but uh, it was certainly prescient. He knew it was coming. I would recommend Pearlstein's work. Somebody asks, I'm a big fan. I read, uh, I read Before the Storm first. A lot of people, you know, they got they got hooked on Reaganland. I read or Nixonland. I read Before the Storm when I was in high school. And. Ugh. It's great stuff. His, his, he does not get the Trump era, but he's a historian, so I don't really demand that he do. You know, it's like if you've got a, a, a lock on a certain time frame because you're able to create a skeleton out of its like social carcass, then I don't see why you can assume it's going to extend beyond that. Like the thing about, I've talked about how I think, I don't know if I have talked about it actually, I talked about it with Will, how Pearlstein's style of media analysis is not practicable now. Like, Pearlstein does, one of the great benefits of Pearlstein's books is that he examines everything. He's, it's, it's, he is giving you a cult, political history of an era, but he understands that politics and culture, this is when they were starting to, the tendrils were starting to, like, capillaries were being built that were going to lead to this current moment we have, which is the total cultural penetration and sublation of politics completely. It started then. That was when the crack broke. The crack open, the, the, the antithesis to like the post-war college uh, ideology, like like the New Deal, uh, 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 the New Deal had created this new modern human who was being factory made in colleges in the fifties and sixties, and it created a synthesis, a, a, a thesis that turned into the modern cosmopolitan liberal subject, and it cracked open. It that that atom splitting created a, an antithesis, which is the reactionary uh, white revanchist, which is now consuming the Republican Party. And the way he tracks it is through tracking the culture. And the way he tracks the culture is through things like TV shows, magazine covers, comic strips, um, uh, movies, popular cultural events. And the thing about that is that in that context, those things make sense. Like when he talks about a bunch of jokes that Johnny Carson tells to talk about the changing attitudes towards um, the Vietnam War, that has, in my opinion, persuasive evidentiary basis because a third of American households watch Johnny Carson. This thing is not, and, and it was like the consensus reality for Americans, like that all politics was laid on top of. So whatever politics is espousing has an actual, it speaks for a monoculture that is being broken up, but is still existing at that point. Now, you couldn't do that. You couldn't look through those things. Like he would, he, Pearlstein would be like, what was, you know, New York Times bestsellers, what were the uh, book of the week main club selections? What was the number one TV show? At a time when you could have, you had three or four, net, three networks, three networks. So that means as a percentage of population, you could have a show being watched by up to a third of the population. Or some of the big ones, half. Inconceivable now. Our cultural diversity is also, by the way, almost entirely within that cultural bubble of the the college educated now, which it was a monoculture, but now it's broken into just a thing referring to other middle class people because it it's been detached because there's no more because it's being privatized. It's now streaming. It's no longer over the waves. It's no longer over the airwaves the way it used to be. And then you've got the internet completely atomizing social uh, connections. How do you pull through the soup of that and get anything like, like that's the thing you have to be in it to be able to express because you get the connotations that get lost in history. Like the, the flesh that melts away to leave the fossils. Like that's a good fossil skeleton of a culture in the 60s and 70s when Pearlstein is writing. Now it's a fucking cartilaginous goo. It's a fucking blobfish. And so that's why I think he doesn't really get the moment the way that a guy like Corey Robin does, for example, who I think has been very good on everything and has, I think, 
shares very similar uh, intellectual antecedents and premises as Perlstein. I think they start from the same place. But I feel like because Robin isn't a historian, because he is more contemporary in his focus, he is able to, uh, to analyze the moment better. And it's why you need both. It's why this isn't a competition. You're, try it's not, you're not condemning good pe people for being good or bad. You're trying to get something out of everybody because there's something out of everyone to be gotten. Because if there isn't, we don't have no hope as a fucking species. Because as hopeless as all this uh, looks, nothing's walking through that door. The fucking gray aliens aren't showing up. There's not going to be 2001 A Space Odyssey all over again. There's no good. We're not going to get a star baby or the fucking Romulans. We have to fucking fix this. And everyone has to fucking contribute. All right, guys. Maybe one question and I'll wrap her up. Ah, feeling good. Feeling good in the neighborhood. Best White Claw is also the best seltzer. Black Cherry. Oh, Black Cherry. Bam, a lamb. Oh, Black Cherry. Bam, a lamb. She says, bam, 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 a lamb. So, bam, a lamb. Bam, a lamb. Delicious. I'm glad someone says I finally have a correct food opinion. I'm a font, motherfucker. I'm a font and a pog and a hoe and an entire hoe. All right, guys. I'm going to go get some food. Peace.